So today I want to talk about uh, what I call deep phonology. And the, the point behind deep phonology is that for the first time, maybe in history, we can actually model language from raw acoustics, from, you know, just recordings of speech. And not only that, we can do that in a fully unsupervised manner. And that's what I, what I want to focus on. Just a little bit of history. So connectionist or neural network models of language, have, of course, long history. I gave some references here. Um, but a lot of the times, these models need at least some level of abstraction, at least some, you know, extracted phonetic features or, you know, fully abstracted set of phonological features. Or they focus on syntax um, or morphology, and they all, almost always involve text representation, textual representations. So, so many models operate a pre with pre-assumed levels of abstraction, either text or features or abstracted, extracted phonetic material, but very few uh, work on purely speech. And that's what I want to focus on here. So the question is, can we model language, you know, both, both phonology, morphology, maybe even syntax from raw acoustic input? without any, you know, textual representation or intermediate representations. And this is, you know, in line with the recent push towards textless, textless NLP that has been happening in the past couple of years or maybe even months, uh, where models increasingly bypass text altogether. So today, I want to give you a model uh, that I call, you know, present a model that I call deep phonology. Um, and... I, I want to claim that with this approach where we can take raw speech and model it with generative adversarial networks with deep convolution, uh, uh, convolutional neural networks, that we, we get an approach that can bring us a lot. I'm going to claim that we can, we can have a, an approach that models both lang uh, all these things that are on the slide. So language acquisition phonetic learning, phonological learning, morphological learning from both production and perception. That's going to be very important because a lot of the models focus either on, or on production or on perception. Here we want to model both. Um, maybe we can you know, touch on even, even syntax. We're going to talk about um, meaningful lear learning of meaningful units in language and how that can emerge in, in a fully unsupervised way completely on its own. In these models, I'm going to talk about language change um, a little bit, and also the two comparisons. So the comparison between artificial neural networks and human behavior, and comparison between artificial neural networks and human brain. And all of that will be done in, uh, in an unsupervised way from raw, raw speech, um, from raw audio. So that's a lot to unpack here. Uh, some of the things I'm going to have to go over quite quickly, uh, but we can, we'll have some time in Q&A. But, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk hopefully quickly so I can cover everything. And just a couple of thoughts that I had when I was preparing this talk. I think phonology is really underrated in cognitive modeling because if we think of it, it is the, the speech and, and, and signs are the only continuous properties, physical properties of language that we can measure and you know, they, that they, they have a continuous component. And humans discretize that continuous space, right? Speech into what we have been calling for hundreds of years, hundred, hundreds of years, phonemes, mental units, discretized units, right? Symbols, in other words. And deep neural networks in many tasks need to do the same, right? If you have a picture, or a class as a convolutional classifier, it needs to take some, some continuous space and discretize it. And so we understand how people do that quite well. And I'm claiming that by modeling phonology, not only we can learn something about with the deep, deep neural network, not only we can learn something about phonology, we can, we can learn also something about how deep neural networks themselves learn internal representations. And there's, there's a several advantages of, of taking speech for that task. Um, you know, people have been comparing artificial neural nets with, you know, brains or, or with performance in, uh, on the visual uh, tasks. But visual tasks are, are, you know, great for that, but they have some disadvantages compared to speech, actually. 
Um, I think we understand speech acquisition relatively well, especially maybe compared to visual acquisition, you know, learning of visual world. Uh, but crucially in speech, we have very readily available production data, which is not necessarily the case in, in the um, visual domain, right? So, you know, we generate speech constantly, human learners babble, and they have very, you know, defined stages of acquisition. And we have really easy access to that production data. And in the visual domain, that's not necessarily always the case, right? You know, we can imagine things in our head, but in order to access that, I'm, I'm going to have to give you a pen and paper and you're going to have to draw something. And there's like an not as direct production data, not as easily available as in speech. And um, production data will, will be important because I'm modeling language with generative models. So a lot of the focus will be on the production itself. So a couple of the claims that I'm going to make is acquisition of speech can be modeled with deep convolutional neural networks within the GAN framework. I'm going to talk a lot about what this is. I'm going to propose a technique for retrieving internal representation, not only behavior data of the models, but internal representation of the models that allow me to basically perform work tests on these models in a very similar way that we do for in, in uh, experimental phonology, for example. I'm going to propose a model that a new model, a new extension of GANs that learns linguistically meaningful information by adding a lexical learning to the, to the network, to the network, to the architecture. And I'm, claim, I'm going to claim that high level representations can be modeled from raw speech, right? From bottom up. And that there, there's insight both from lang for language acquisition from this line of work, but also for how CNNs learn internal representations. I'm going to focus throughout the talks on a couple of important aspects that I think emerge in, in this modeling and that have a lot of implications for this higher level debate in cognitive science, which is uh, in cognitive science and in, in you know, the field of artificial intelligence or machine learning, which is the question of how our mind works or how, you know, what kind of networks will we need in order for them to perform a well or at the human level. And that is the famous debate is the, between connectionist and symbolic approaches to deep learning and also language. And a couple of things I'm going to focus on are discrete disentangled representations that emerge in these models, the causal relationship between latent space and meaningful units in language, and um, categoricity of outputs. So a brief ov overview of this talk, I'm going to roughly inter briefly introduce the model. I'm going to give you some case studies and then base my conclusion of, on those. So the very first, um, the easiest proposal that we can start with is phonetic and phonological uh, acquisition can be modeled as the dependency between latent space and generated data in GANs. So, you know, you can model phon phon phonological learning in many ways um, with rules or with um, constraints or with, you know, finite state automata. But this is just another approach, namely model phonology as the dependency between latent space and generated data in GANs. And what are GANs? Just a brief overview. It's a deep learning architecture where you have the generator that takes some latent space, randomly distributed variables, and generates data through a series of convolutional layers. And then the discriminator that takes real and generated data and forces the generator to produce real-life data. So at the beginning, of course, training is, you know, generator just produces noise, but in time, the generator becomes good, so good that it's basically tricking the discriminator into thinking that it's producing real data. Now, the crucial part, the crucial difference here is that GANs do not replicate data. The objective here is not replication of data, which is going to be very important. This is unlike, for example, autoencoders, where they need to just replicate the exact same output as they get input. So this basically GANs learn by um, imitation or imagination, if you want, and that's very appealing for language acquisition. So why are they? Why are GANs appealing for language acquisition? It's a generative model, so not only we can test production perception, but also production. So the network needs to learn to output some meaningful data from noise. As I mentioned, they don't replicate, but 
but innovate. And innovate, innovative outputs are going to be very inform, informative for cognitive modeling. I'm going to talk a lot about those innovative outputs that actually violate training data. It's unsupervised, fully unsupervised, right? So it, unsupervised to the degree that the generator never directly accesses data at all, right? So it's just per, it, um, being trained on tricking another network into thinking it's producing real data. And uh, to my knowledge, the language acquisition has not been previously modeled with GITs. We can start with the simplest thing that, you know, one of the simplest processes in language, in phon phonetics slash phonology, which is English pit spit distinction, right? In English, if you have a, a stressed, uh, a stop before a stressed so vowel, you have um, aspiration. If you add, add an S to it, that aspiration is gone. This is you can call it the English aspiration rule. And in the classic SPE type phonology, this would be written as, you know, as a rule. But you can see there's like very little phonetic, raw phonetic happening in a rule formalism of SPE. So how, how can we model this um, from, from bottom, up, bottom up? So we can train the network to uh, on timid sliced data with TV and STV sequences, right? The TA versus SPA, or, you know, whatever sequences there are, train it on, on a GAN network and, and see what they do. So it's the simplest behavior type of experiment you can, you can, you can make. And it, we can see that the network learns to, you know, produce long VOT. This is generated data. I'm going to try to play some recordings. Okay. This is a care. So you can hear that the aspiration is gone when S proceeds. So the network learns to de-aspirate just like humans do, um, English speakers do. And you can, you know, behaviorally test the model. So this is like significant, shows like a significant difference in BOT duration when S proceeds um, the, out, the generated output of the generator. Now, as I mentioned, GANs innovate and their innovative outputs are actually extremely interesting. So if, you know, if you're an engineer and you only care about performance, you're going to discard those cases as erroneous. But if you actually are doing cognitive modeling, these are the most valuable outputs because sometimes the networks still produces extremely long BOT, even if S proceeds the, uh, in the output, right? So you can hear this sta, which probably to English speakers sounds weird because the network fails to shorten the VOT here if S proceeds. Now, the interesting thing here, if you look at the data distribution, so this is VOT durations when S proceeds and in the timid, red is timid training data. And blue is, or green is generated data. So you see in about 10 to 12, 10 to 15% of cases, the network produces longer VOT than any of the VOTs in the training data. Because again, these are innovative outputs. The network learns to, you know, by, by imitation, not replication. And it produces extremely long VOTs in the S condition where it shouldn't you know, be, there shouldn't be a no long, long VOTs there. If you look at language acquisition, kids do the same. So the kids learn first, they start with short VOT because long VOT is difficult to produce. Then they learn long VOT, but right, the S condition is the rare one, right? Is the more limited context and they fail to learn the rule. We know that learning rules are, is costly. And so they fail to learn the rule and they produce long VOTs in the S condition as well. So you, you can, you can kind of compare language acquisition stages directly and, and, and stages in, in, in GANs. We'll see later. We can, we can actually see how the, this progression of learning happens as well. Something that I'm going to just touch on is if you iteratively train these models over a couple of generations, you know, when, when, when a GAN learns, the first generation of GANs learns from TIMIT, but the second generation learns from the first generation's generated outputs. And the, and the third generation, you know, learns from the second gen uh, generator's generated outputs. And so um, you see that it, 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 you can model language change with, or you know, sound change with this kind of iterative learning. So we, if you combine deep learning and iterative learning, you get nice 
way of modeling sound change from raw acoustics, you see that gradually the, the VOT becomes longer and longer in the S condition, right? A nice gradual phonetic change, whereas in the no S condition, it remains stable throughout generations. The X axis is our generations. But I'm not going to talk too much about sound change, um, but there, there is a way to, to model, you know, the, the model allows us to model language change as well. So um, this is behavioral data, right? So you, we, could, we, could, we could end our story here, but it's actually way more interesting than this. So we can look at internally what's happening in these models. And this is where I'm proposing a couple of the techniques that really allow us to, to analyze what the networks are learning. So the way LIGANs look like in a, in, a, in a more detail, right? So we have a generator with five convolutional layers. We have the generated audio, this, which is the end result. And in the latent space, we usually have, uh, you know, 100 or however many you want latent variables that are usually uniformly distributed from minus one to one. This go ba goes back to DC GAN, which came out in around 2015. And before that, it was um, Goodfellows, you know, per, per, at all proposal that, that, you know, introduced GANs to begin with. So we, we, I propose a technique to identify variables that correspond to phon phonetic or phonological features. So how do we do that? We can basically use a sewer regression and test which variable, which latent space variable of those 100 corresponds most strongly to some linguistically meaningful units in the generated data, right? So this is the sewer regression estimates. We have 100 variables, and the network identified a, a few of them as the ones that are most strongly correspond to some phonetic property. In our case, the most salient phonetic property that we're going to start with is the presence of S. Okay, so the network identifies uh, the, the, this technique, you know, basically a re regression technique between latent space and generated data identifies 11th variable as the one that most strongly corresponds to to S in, in the output. And you see somewhat discretized. Remember, I, I mentioned I'm going to be focusing on disentangled representation. You see a couple of variables out of all 100, a couple of variables more strongly correspond to S in, in the output, right? In others, you have in, in other variables, you have a more distributed estimates. So there is some evidence of disentanglement here, not yet full. Um, it's not ideal yet, but later on we'll see that sometimes you get, you know, you get really, really discretized representations where only a single variable corresponds to something that is you know, like linguistically meaningful, like a morpheme or you know, a reduplication or S in the output. But anyway, the important thing here is that the relationship between individual latent variables, for example, Z11. And the presence of S in the output is linear, although it didn't have to be. Okay, that is very that is a crucial uh, thing here. So y-axis gives you a probability of S in the output. X-axis here gives you a value of Z. Now you see I tested this with non-linear non regression, yet the estimates seem to be quite linear. Not only for this particular Z11, but for other that correspond strongly to S as well. Now, crucially, where we, you know, the way we get causal relationship between some meaningful unit in the output and our, our latent space is the question, what happens outside of the training range? Okay, so most work focuses on the training range. But here, we take a single unit and basically test what, how the generation works, the gen generated data works. If we generate data with only a single variable set at the very high levels, okay, at, at like level like outside of training range. As I, mean, I, I remember, so training range is uniformly distributed from minus one to one. So I want to see what happens at minus 50 or minus 25. So that's crucial here. So dependencies that extend beyond the training range. By manipulating those, we can control the output and explore the causal relationship between the linguistically meaningful units and latent space. For example, if, my, if I set my Z11 to minus 15, which is way outside the training range, the network still generates you know, real-looking data, 
and 87 out of 100 outputs contain an S. At man is 25, this is 96 out of 100 barrier, uh, outputs, right? So basically, I, I, get, I get S all, of, all the time. What I'm doing here is I'm, t I'm basically extracting what underlying value, what underlying meaningful linguistic property each latent variable encodes by you know setting it its value so high that it's overriding lower level interactions that is that are happening in the latent space okay that's roughly what 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 we're doing here and then crucially for the causal relationship we can we can interpolate from you know extreme value of values like minus 15 to back to plus 15 or zero and see, basically, in other words, we're, we're, we're testing what happens when, when, you know, when you set the variable to minus 15, which says be in the, be very strongly in the, uh, in the output towards be not, you know, not be in the output very strongly and in, and in interpolate from minus 15 to plus 15. And what we observe is this really interpretable process where the, the amplitude of S just shrinks. It's the amplitude. I mean, it, even if we control the amplitude of the vowel, when when we when we manipulate the the eleventh variable that corresponds to an S, the amplitude of S in the output will just gradually decrease, and you can hear that gradual decre decrease. I'm using the single unit. And the latent space, single variable, and interpolated its value from um, uh, way outside the training range toward back toward the training range that says, you know, from being the output to not being the output. And you can see a causal effect where the amplitude of S just goes um, down. Okay, so you say you might have an objection by now saying, oh, this is just, you know, the network has no way to represent meaning. It's just producing data and it doesn't really know that there's an S there. It just happens to be the case that S, S was encoded with, with somewhat disentangled representations. So um, in, a, in a paper, I propose some meaningful representation to them. So how does this work? So we have the same ingredients as before, generator and discriminator, but we add a, a separate net, a Q network. Usually it's, it's done, um, you know, discriminator and the Q network are together, but here we had a, add a separate Q network. And what does that Q network do? It basically mimics the perceptual learning in speech. Okay. So what ha happens? So the network, the generator still generates data and sends it to the discriminator. And discriminator gets real data and generated data and needs to decide between what is what. Two architectures, FIW GAN and CIW GAN, which is basically an inf information theoretic extension of GANs that is able to learn linguistically meaningful units and, as and assign. Um, but then the generator also generates data and sends it to the Q network. Now, here there is a slight modification of latent space. In addition to the a uniformly distributed values that we saw, the network also takes a code, right? The generator now takes a code and it generates data. So for example, it takes a 100 in a one hot encoding and it generates this data. The Q network takes raw audio, generated audio, and needs to figure out what hidden code did the generator have when it was producing this output. So you train the, the generators to basically maximize the mutual information between the latent space and, and the um, generated data. Or in other words, you train the generators so that it's maximizing the Q, network, Q network's success, right? It wants to generate informative data. That's the only thing you, you, you're doing, we're doing here. And um, we're forcing the generator to generate informative data so that another network will know what unique information slash code did it have when it was producing this particular data point. So this is just a schematic zoom. And nice thing, uh, the extension that I call the FIW GAN is Featural Information Wave GAN, which is instead of one hot encoding, we get the fe uh, binary features here, a binary code here. And the binary code allows us both holistic learning 
right? Where each, each code can represent, say, a lexical item. And then feature encoding, right? Where each bit in this code can represent sublexical information. That's, act, that's actually what happens. The generator is a generator, and then Q network is the lexical learning that, that basically needs to figure out what you need code did the generator have when it was producing this output. So the first thing I, do, I did is I trained it on toy data, 10 lexical items from Timit. There's nothing that, you know, there's nothing specific that forces the generator here to learn lexical items. You know, the generator could learn anything about speech. It could learn to encode gender. It could learn to encode, you know, rate, speech rate, length of utterances. So these are sliced words that I, I in, in raw audio form that I, it unlabels, of course, that I give this model. And the network le learns to, basically encode lexical items in the encodes. If you, if you give it 10 classes, it learned to encode 10 lexical items into its, its code representation. Even the, if there's a mismatch between the number of classes and, and the number of lexical items, it learn, basically it learns lexi uh, lexical items words, right? Why? Because the most informative thing to do is to encode unique information, unique codes, in, or associate them with unique unique lexical items. Now, the FIW GAN extension is especially interesting because, because of, of innovative outputs, right? So the network learns again, learns to encode, you know, I trained the network on eight words from Timit. It learns to encode each word with unique code, but then it produces innovative outputs as well. Right, it was trained on ask, carry, dark, greasy, like, suit, water, near, and there's nothing, there's no start in that training data set. Yet it produces outputs that sound awfully like um, like start, start, start. Right, so the network never even had an ST sequence in the training data, but because it learns a lot about speech, even on those limited amount of data on, on those eight lexical items right here, and it learns to innovate and produce new words that could well, uh, that are words of English, right? Because it learns to, you know, combine, so to speak, phoneme phonemes into new sequences, novel sequences. Um, and it has a way to represent that start is basically dark with an added S and T at the end. So if you combine suit and dark, which are part of training data, um, you get something like yeah, like start. But but note that you know this is on a withheld from training. This is just a comparison. This was never part of training data. But look at how the network is really good at putting together two sequences of sounds that were never part of training data. Right? This is SD in the generated data, and this is SD in human speech. And the network never saw an SD together before. Yet it was able to you know combine it anew in a quite good uh, good way. It also produces something like SART, which is not a word of English, right? Here you have SART, it combines S and ART, but could well be a word of English. It's a valid sequence. Um, I also mentioned I'm gonna talk about categoricity and, and you know, symbolic uh, representation. Sim people on the symbolic side say, well, you know, if you're a connectionist, you're never going to get 100% a probability of one in the outputs. Here with the proposed techniques where we, technique where we, we generate with values of latent space well outside the training range, we can get very close to that, right? So the, as I mentioned, the network learns to associate each unique code with unique lexical item. If instead of 001, I generated, I generate with 0015, which is way, way outside training ring, I get almost categorical inputs where you know a single word gets generated for each code. Okay. So um, it's it gets a little loud, loud, loud but uh, um, noisy, but you can hear greasy here. When I generate the code 1500, I get like a hundred percent of the time. Greasy, output greasy. Okay, so it goes on and on and on. Basically, I'm, I'm, I'm getting at what underlying representation 
each code has. And this is very valuable and, and, and can be used in other applications as well here. Okay, this is just to show that we can scale to bigger data as well. I trained the network on entire Timit, which is like 6,000 lexical items with 13, uh, and, and, and trained the network with 13 variables, 13 code variables, which is extreme dense, extremely dense representation. Like no other unsupervised acoustic word embedding model has such de dense representation where you have to learn like, 6,000 classes with only 13 variables. And it's, you know, the perfect, the, the learning is not perfect, but, but in about 40% of cases, the, there is a clear uh, correspondence where each word corresponds, one word corresponds to a unique code. Another thing that is important here is we can use the Q network as now as a classifier or in cognitive modeling terms, we can use it as a network that, that represents the perception aspect of speech perception production loop, right? So this is a recent paper that we're going to present in at Interspeech Conference. So we can, we can test how lexical learning works in, in the generator, but by generating outside of training range and, and seeing what, what we are getting in the generated data. But we can also take test data, right? So we train all these three networks on Timit training data part. Then we split Timit into test and training, and then feed unobserved test data to the Q network. And it turns out that, of course, the Q network learns to classify novel and absorbed words with unique, unique codes. Okay, so you, you give the Q network greasy, and it'll give the same code as the generator had for greasy. So basically, you're, we're, we're we're modeling both production and perception here at the same time. Most of the models, both in speech technology and in cognitive modeling, either focus on production or perception. And here, we're basically, the, the lexical learning happens because the production and perception work together, right? Because the Q network and the generator work together. Here are some of the results. And we also see evidence in the Q network, right? That, you know, in individual, individual code represent unique lexical items, but there is sublexical structure in bits, right? So bit two, three, and five encode the presence of S, word initial S, for example. And you can, again, go back and test it in a generative way by taking those three bits and interpolating them, right, from, you know, values outside of training range. And we get, again, a causal relationship where, you know, as you interpolate three bits out of nine bits, for example, from zero to one, it gives you S that gradually appears or disappears from the output, right? So here you see S in appears or disappears from the output, and most of, most of the time, nothing else changes in the output, which is nice. So we can have like, now we, we, we can basically model both lexical learning and sublexical representation, right? So... Uh, featural and holistic learning, so if you want. Okay, so I'm going to have to go quickly over the co a couple of further applications. Um, this is the main architecture that I'm working with, and I'm going to show you a, three case studies where we can, we can basically work te test the networks, uh, see how learning works, we can compare human behavior with the, net, the outputs, and also brain techniques, and we can... Um, we are working, we, we, we proposed a, a way to not only interpret what happens in the latent space, but also in the intermediate convolution layers, which gives you, which gives you a lot of potential for comparing brain and um, neural networks. But before that, a, a short word on reduplication. Um, reduplication has been widely discussed in, in literature because it's a very complex process and it has long been, you know, th thought that it, Neural networks cannot do it, and kids, of course, are very good at it. Most of the proposals that say yes, replication can be done in a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model again work with with phonemes or features, right? Abstract representation. So here we can work test the networks by feeding it raw data. How do we do that? We recorded a speaker saying like about thousand duplicated and unreduplicated words and made up words, Bali, Papali, Bali, Babali, Mali, Mamali. But we withheld 
Sasali. So the S initial words are never reduplicated. And this is how we, you know, the model learns. The model needs to learn from raw waveforms. The spectrograms are just for representation here. From raw, so it only get, it gets unpaired, unlabeled, reduplicated, and unreduplicated forms. And we use the CIW GAN architecture, where you have the generator, the discriminator, and the Q network, and give it to classes, right? Learn two things about this data set. And you know, a smart model or you know, an informative model would learn reduplication with a code zero one and non-reduplication with code one zero or something like that. And vice versa is also possible, right? And this is actually what happens, right? So again, you can test with, with generation outside of training range. When when you set the net when, once you train the network and you test what what, what generate the data looks like, five zero means no reduplication. And 0, 05 means a lot of replication. But it's got better than that. You can we can actively turn a reduplicated form into unreduplicated form or vice versa by interpolating only these two codes, right? So you're basically interpolating from one zero to zero one, saying be reduplicated to not be reduplicated. And you see how the replication syllable gradually appears or disappears from the output. And this is identity-based pattern, right? It's very complex to learn. You know, it has been termed, it has been long thought that it, neural networks cannot do that. They cannot do copying or, or replication, but clearly here they can in a very interpretable way. And um, also the replication extends to novel unobserved data. Right, so now we have a way, a way to work test the network. So S was never duplicated in the training data, and we can say, well, I can force reduplication, right, by by setting my code to five zero, and I can force S in the output by finding those latent variables that correspond to an S. When I set those two at the same time, the network should produce. Uh, S initial reduplicated form, although it never saw it before. If it didn't learn the identity-based pattern, it'll produce something like, you know, Nasara or Nasara, right? It'll just concatenate. But if it learned the uh, identity-based pattern, it'll produce Nasara. And this is actually what the network does. Here's the... The first case is generated data. The second is human recording from withheld training data. So that... Reduplication as initial reduplication was never part of training data. Okay, this was replicated because I didn't believe it at first. Um, so, so another strong evidence in favor of it. And since we're slightly running out of time, the another another couple of cases where you know another way ways to leverage these modeling is we can basically compare outputs of these generated outputs compare, combined with work tests that we can perform on these models to human human behavior of data. Basically, one, ni one nice finding from this paper I had in 2021 20, uh, is that GANs are inform produce informative data even in trained on extremely small data sets, like 280 words, which allows us to basically train a GAN network on the same data as we use for artificial grammar learning experiments. Here I tested harmony, which is non non local um, pattern, and also some local patterns, and it, we we basically can compare them to human performance and see that you know whether the the learning of non non local patterns like harmony um, is similar or or not similar to human levels. But basically, any other artificial grammar learning experiments can be done on these GANs as well and then compared to human behavior data. Another, another interesting thing, as I mentioned here as well, is that we can, we can trace um, learning progress as the networks are you know, being trained. And we can see that they use very similar uh, strategies that humans use when they're learning data. As, as training progresses. So, you know, at 7,000 training steps, they produce something like Zillow, which is not part of training. And then they turn it into Sulo, Fulo, Tulo, you know, they, they uh, devoice 
2000 training steps fast forward, they, they uh, distribute application noise a couple of thousand training steps later and so on. So they use interpretable techniques when they're searching through potential outputs. So this is, this is the artificial neural networks, human behavior comparison part. And then finally, I'm going to just briefly talk about some recent work where we use internal, we, we, we can, we, we propose a techniques, a technique that gives us an interpretable way to understand what happens in intermediate convolutional layers. So here you see, I'm not going to go into details, but a, a, a simple summation of intermediate of um, individual feature maps in convolutional layers gives you a really nice um, summary of what happens at each convolutional layer, right? This is a generator and it has five convolutional layers. And now we, we, we can understand not only what happens in those hundred latent variables and the gener generated output, but we can understand how these latent variables get transformed through convolutional layers into generated output. Here are some visualization where you can see how, you know, something that is in the, you know, this is the output. This is a fourth layer where a lot of things are encoded very faithfully, right? So you hear an S, you see an S, you see a silence uh, due to closure, you see volcanic peri periodic vibration. Yes, and, and the final thing is, so, so this is a couple of techniques where we, you know, we in introspect how the network rep represent various linguistic property in those intermediate convolutional layers. And then we can also compare how intermediate convolutional layers work and how human brain works. And this is a recent, we have a recent preprint in BioArchive where we basically show that auditory brainstem response encodes information, speech information in a very similar way as earlier convolutional layers. This is an example from a brain experiment. Uh, you see electric potentials for EEG auditory brainstem response data. And we show that peak latency depends on language experience, both in humans and in their brainstem and in artificial neural networks when they're trained on Spanish versus English data, for example. So the, the important thing here is that we have an interpretable way to compare artificial neural networks and the brain and not only use correlations, but, but actually use concrete acoustic properties and see how they're encoded, right? Because we have a way to basically get time series data for each convolutional layer. Um, this is just some, some evidence for similar encoding between Spanish um, and English listeners in the brain experiment and Spanish and English trained model. And again, we work both on production and perception. So um, I'm at the end. Um, I think we, we started five minutes later, so we have probably about 10 minutes for Q&A, hopefully. Uh, but it's just to conclude, perfect. Just to conclude, I, I hope I presented a model, an approach to language where we start from raw audio, in a fully unsupervised way. Um, and we have now a way to, do, to model language acquisition, phonology from both perce perception and production side. Morphology, I talked about, I didn't talk about, but uh, well, morphology, I talked about in the duplication experiment. But there are other cases, case studies that I have um, as well. And, you know, currently in our lab, we're working on um, representing basic syntax with these models. We can do language change. We can do behavioral artificial neural network comparison, uh, brain neural network comparison. And we're adding, uh, we're currently adding articulatory component. We got some early promising results where the GANs are not producing data, wave, waveform data, but actual, um, actual articulatory data. And so I hope that I convince you that by modeling speech data with convolutional neural nets, we can learn both about how language and its acquisition work, and also how deep learning, how deep neural network learn their internal representations. So with some literature, I thank you for your attention. If you have any questions or ideas or proposals, there's a lot to be done, um, in my opinion. A lot of the work is available. Uh, most of the work actually is available on my website, where you can also get code and also some repositories with pre-trained models. But just send me an email if you have any questions.
I'd be happy to chat more. And I think with that, I can thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them.